When, when Paul spoke this morning and talked about the themes of today's gathering and emphasized creativity, I was reminded of research by a University of Chicago economist by the name of David Galenson, who's unusual in the economics field because he studies creativity and he doesn't study it from the perspective of an art historian or a, th a theorist. He's a macro economist who studied initially the price of every valuable painting sold over the past hundred years. And he looked at these numbers and tried to discover a pattern. And what he found is that they, the most valuable paintings were all done by people who were very young or very old. And he couldn't figure this out. And he eventually came up with a theory about young geniuses um, and old masters that he attributes to different styles of creativity. Uh, conceptual genius tends to bloom early and experimental genius takes a very long time to gestate and, and is manifest later. And he gives the examples of, um, of Mozart in music, you know, who's these full-blown beautiful concertos emerged from his head. And then Cezanne, who you know, worked tirelessly for years and whose most valuable work wasn't done until he was in his late 60s. And as I was thinking about this beautiful marriage today between McGill and Change Nation, um, about Paul, about Joe, um, it seems like we have our own Mozart and Cezanne. And <laughs> in it, um, to pick up on what you were saying this morning, Joe, I sort of oxygen for young and old and all of those of us in the middle uh, as well. Um, and so I, I think it's just a perfect context and setting to think about a society that makes full use of its talents of younger people, of older people, to be more creative, to navigate the challenges of, of this century. This is going to be in 10 years, as I'm sure everybody here knows, and I've just recently learned Ireland's 100th anniversary as a state. Um, but it turns out that the 21st century is uh, a century of those kinds of anniversaries, a, a century of centuries. Half the children born since 2000 in the developed world are projected to see their 100th birthday. So we're used to thinking of, of life in much shorter terms. When Ireland was founded, average lifespan was about 50. Now it's already approximating 80 and heading upwards. So we've been really quite skilled when it comes to extending lives. In fact, the gains over the past century are equivalent to all those previous increases in all of human history. We've done that in one century. But when I was looking at the image of Patrick McGill, I, I, I was reminded of JFK. There's there's more than a, than a small likeness. And JFK in the early 60s said we'd added years to life. The problem was, we, was that we'd yet to add life to those years. And I think that's something that we face increasingly today as a challenge. In the United States, 10,000 people a day are turning 60, but they face a confusing state. We hear on the one hand that 60 is the new 40. You're supposed to cling to your lost youth. Um, on the other hand, you get senior citizen discounts as early as 50, so apparently 60 is also the old 80. Uh, there's an economist in the United States, John Chauvin, who points out that that definition of 60 or 65 as old age is itself old-fashioned. It doesn't even come from the 20th century. It was the 19th century definition that Otto von Bismarck used to determine eligibility for the Prussian military pension, convinced the state would never pay out a single pension. He was 78 at the time, an idea that, that probably didn't occur to him. So today we've got this great midlife migration of people moving into this period. Um, and yet when it comes to even the identity for the period, the s social scientists talk about the young old, the working retired, can the walking dead be too far off? These oxymoronic contradictions in terms, you know, split difference between your earlier life and, and what lies ahead. And at a, at a societal level, there's similar confusion, this sense of a contradiction. You go to the doctors and they tell you to walk around the block and eat your vegetables, reduce stress so that you can live long. And we do hear this celebration of the longevity revolution. But you pick up the op-ed pages and you hear about this 
coming gray tsunami, the age quake, just about every disaster metaphor has been invoked to, to describe the societal condition that we're facing. And it all raises a question that how is this wonderful personal triumph, the best thing that happened to us as individuals, the worst thing that happened to us as society as a, as a long gray wave of greedy geezers soon takes posterity to the cleaners. Um, and and it, it's also portrayed as inevitable. Demography is destiny is one thing that we, we hear. So, so what's the way out of this, this great dilemma? I mean, we do want to live long. We do want to try to, to maximize our own lifespan, and we are making great progress. But does it have to be the downfall of the broader community? Um, we also hear about these coming generational conflicts. Kids versus canes is, is a phrase that's popular in the United States today as walkers outnumber strollers. Um, there's a, a film that probably many of you have seen that came out in recent months, The Best Exotic Marigold Hotel, which proposes one solution, outsourcing the elderly. We'll just send everybody over 60 to the developing world um, where it is less expensive to retire. Um, I'm here to propose a different solution as Anne um, um, already described, which is that the nature of later life is under every bit as radical a transformation as those numbers that we're so familiar with. And that this constitutes one of the great opportunities for social innovation of this century. I don't think 60s the new 40 or the old 80, I think 60 is the new 60. And these tens of millions of people all over the globe flooding into this territory are something entirely new on the landscape. They're essentially the, the first mass denizens of a new stage of life, which probably strikes many of you as counterintuitive. New stages of life, life stages are, you know, you don't just insert a season between summer and fall and declare it so they seem like eternal verities, like fixtures, but in fact, they're fictions. Their inventions to solve social problems. Retirement itself, the golden years, was an attempt to make virtue out of what we saw as a necessity, having all these people over the hill in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Youth was a creation of the early part of the 20th century. We invented adolescence in America in 1904 because we had the neither nors of that period. You know, I talked earlier about people who are sort of neither in midlife and neither in old age. Then we had all these young people who were neither children, they weren't adults, and so we had to come up with a way of dealing with them because we were worried they were gonna run amok, that they had the physical maturity of adults but were still not emotionally mature. So we invented youth, we invented adolescence, and it was invented by a 60-year-old, a psychologist named G. Stanley Hall. And he, um, he created this period, this moratorium period, essentially to, to solve what was seen as a as a problem in, in the United States at that point, and the history in Europe is similar. But 20 years later, he was actually the first person to propose a new stage of life between midlife and old age. He said that society needed maturity every much, much, a bit as much as it needed youthful vigor. And he described this period that was opening up as an Indian summer. And he said that human beings didn't reach the height of their capacity until the shadows started slanting eastward. He was no uh, Patrick McGill, but he was class poet in his uh, university. And, but the essence of, of what Hall talked about actually was this sweet spot, a kind of uh, new crown of life in which people had the benefits of experience and the capacity to do something with it, a kind of act of wisdom, not just the ability to leave a legacy, but to actually live one. And now, it's almost a century after Hall first articulated this Indian summer notion. We've got all these big numbers of people doubling of the population uh, over 60 all over the world. And in many countries, as you probably know, unlike Ireland and the United States, in Germany, Japan, South Korea, Italy, Spain, between 40 and 50% of the entire population will be over 60 by mid-century. So if there is ever a need for innovation, it's, it's in the midst of these demographic changes. And I think what we need for this, for this period is not only uh, a vision that solves the problem, but takes advantage of the particular virtues, the, those that I talked about earlier, that idea of active wisdom that's represented by this population. 
And I think really understanding the motivation of people as they reach this point in life, which in many ways uh, is rooted in the experience, that ha opportunity of having been around the block, but it's also out of the recognition of mortality. You realize as you hit your 50s and 60s, I've realized it myself, that there are far fewer years ahead than there are behind. And that changes your perspective, it changes your priorities. And I, I think a lot of that French Revolution slogan around, about liberty and equality and fraternity, um, I think that the adage for this stage of life could be mortality, longevity, and urgency. You realize that the road doesn't go on forever, but you also realize it's probably gonna go on for quite a bit longer, so there's a chance to do something with those insights. And then you remember how fast the last 25 years shot by, and you realize it's time to actually get going. So for individuals, for society, we need to do that. But that vision alone, that realization, is not enough. We need a whole new wave of social institutions. Just think of what we created around retirement in the past century. We created pension systems, we created uh, senior centers, retirement villages. It was a really remarkable wave of creativity that turned later life into something that people could genuinely look forward to. And I think we need to muster those same resources, particularly as people navigate their way into this uncharted territory, this stage that has no name at this, at this point between midlife and, and old age. And I think it starts with a new kind of education. We were wonderful at creating lifelong learning and now I think we have education for young people and education for old people, but we don't really have education for middle people or late middle people moving into this period. And I think we need internships just like we have for young people to help people find their footing in this passage. In America, we've started something called an Encore Fellowship, and it's a fellowship, a nine to 12 month fellowship for people over 50 who wanna move into careers as change makers, who wanna follow that Ashoka spirit. Um, but really, they've been working so hard in midlife, uh, raising families, they have no idea how to get started. So we've been working with corporations, initially with HP. This past fall, Intel announced that any retirement eligible employee in the United States can do an Encore Fellowship. They'll pay the full $25,000 for that fellowship. They'll pay their health insurance during that period. They'll pay the administrative costs of the program. They'll move it from a philanthropy initiative to a human resource benefit for people. And I hope many more companies will follow suit. Here in Ireland, there are enormous number of innovations already underway. Uh, the Third Age Foundation is doing remarkable work. Uh, the Aging Well Network has a, a, a beautiful notion of wisdom time banks, but I think it's all being pulled together in a way that achieves a potential critical mass through Encore Ireland, which has received the blessing of the Taoiseach and Martin Fraser and involves a number of groups that are already here today. And so I think here in Ireland, maybe even more than any place else in, in the world that I know of, including my own country, you're poised to turn this longevity paradox, that zero sum proposition, good for older people, bad for everybody else, into a payoff, into something that, thanks Paul. into a potential windfall of talent that I think can only be compared to what happened to societies as a result of the women's movement, right? We had all these women who moved into new roles that had been off limits to their mother's generation in the 1960s and the 1970s. And what did we hear at that point too? That it was also gonna be a zero sum proposition. Good for those women, but they were just gonna displace men. We'd end up in the same place as we started, but with a lot of pain and suffering along the way. And we now know that the society that makes full use of its talent is more productive, it's richer, it does a better job solving its problems. And we also know from that experience that it wasn't just about those boomer women themselves who broke into new roles, but that they were setting a new pattern and a new uh, opening up new opportunities for all those younger women who were coming on their heels. And I think the millions of people today who are transforming this new stage from a, a gray dawn into an Indian summer are doing it for themselves, they're doing it for their society, they're doing it for all those younger people who are coming on their, on their heels. And I think pioneering a new pattern of life that not only will help younger people look forward to this period, 
but change what the prospects are in youth. Why load up all your education between 18 and 25 when it's hard to know at 18 what you're going to want to do at 58? Um, and so I think we're in the midst of a much larger product of rebalancing the joys and opportunities of productivity across these much longer lifespans, not just three score and 10, but something approximating five score. And I think in the process, uh, we can not only solve many of the problems that ail us today through this great infusion of talent and creativity, but I think rekindle this idea of generativity in society. Eric Erickson, who was the great scholar of this period in the second half of life, said that successful development could be encapsulated in the phrase, I am what survives of me. And I can think of no better benediction for this partnership between Change Nation and McGill and everything that we're going to be talking about in this panel. Thank you.